When we talk about the expansion of the Mughal Empire in its early years, surely a lot of claim, rightly so, goes to Bairam Khan and the role he played as an able Mughal general, leading Akbar's armies when Akbar was just a boy. But that is not to say that eventually Akbar himself was not a military genius who didn't fully fathom the powerful role he played. He did. He expanded the Mughal Empire widely even after Bairam Khan died. Akbar invested in technical improvements of the weapons in use at the time, like gunpowder, something his grandfather famously used against Ibrahim Lodi at the Battle of Panipat. Akbar also improved upon the design of the basic musket and developed lighter weight cannons so it was easy to transport it to battle. He even worked upon functional designs of rockets and swivel guns which could be fitted on top of camels and elephants in battle. But military genius is not all about killing your opponents and leaving behind bloodied masses of dead armies onto fields. It is also about winning without warfare. Akbar understood that. And how exactly did that work? The answer is Kamargha. There is unclarity whether it's Kumargha or Kamargha. And that obviously arises from the fact that in Persian, vowels were not very clearly used. But let's go with Kumargha for now. So what was Kumargha? Kumargas were ring hunts near target territory, that is, territory that Akbar wanted to bring under the Mughal Empire. While it looked like Akbar was just out on a regular hunt, Kumarga was actually a psychological tactic that everyone understood, including the target territory near which the hunt was organized. Everyone knew what was actually happening. Everyone knew what looked like a regular hunt was not a regular hunt. It was a frightening display of Akbar's soldiers' skills, their weapons, their numbers, their enormous power. The hunt was organized to display to the target territory Akbar's wealth, power, army. And the fact that they were near your territory told you he wants to talk and he is willing to accept a peaceful surrender without needing to use his army. In most cases, you surrendered. Another wise thing about Akbar was that he intuitively understood the nobility's humiliation at surrendering and at the same time his own need to tie together an empire that was more like a risky mosaic of different cultures, religions, languages and heritages that India famously is and has always been. Instead of trying to foolishly homogenize it all under one identity, he let the local rulers rule but under his name. This was more profitable for both the sides, and it was in this way that Akbar really created an imperial administration peopled by those who cared for their local areas and were loyal to the Mughal Empire. At this point, I feel like saying that this creates an impression that Akbar was a peaceful man who avoided killing wherever he could. But saying that would not be true. While we cannot call him a bloodthirsty maniac, there have been enough instances in his life where he did show us a shocking lack of mercy. The massacres of Malwa and of Gondwana did happen under his watch. Even some cases of him controlling fierce animals do show a certain lack of mercy, which at this point we can also recall the battle he caused between the sannyasis, which led to so many deaths and according to contemporary reports, Akbar took delight in the deaths of sannyasis and his own soldiers. So, so that was military. Similarly, in terms of richness and revenue compared to how rich the Mughal Empire ultimately became, that was not the empire that Akbar had actually inherited. In fact, in the early years of his reign, there was a point when once Akbar wanted some money and he asked Munim Khan, who was managing funds, and Munim Khan told him that the imperial treasury didn't actually have the sum of money that Akbar wanted. How much money was it that he actually wanted? 17 rupees. This was when the empire's revenue and tax collection system were given a thorough shake-up. It was the same land revenue system that was in use since the time of Sher Shah Sur. It was a system based on estimates for tax based on land size, crop yield, market price. But in the 1560s, Akbar began collecting data on actual market prices and revenue rates of various crops. So, at that time, India was organized like this. Small villages grouped together into the tiniest official unit made one pargana. Many parganas together made up a sarkar. Many sarkars together made up a suba, 
and many subahs were managed by subedar. Tax at the grassroots level was collected by zamidars who were mostly Hindus, and they were now made officers under the Mughal state. The land revenue was now collected not in crops but in cash, the copper dam, and this monetized the rural economy. And while it may sound simple, it revolutionized the Mughal economy. And it's not as if Akbar was not conscious of the greatness of his actions. In Ain e Akbari, he says, "It was the effect of the grace of God that I found no capable minister; otherwise, people would have considered my measures had been devised by him." In reality, this is not entirely true. Akbar was surrounded by some extraordinary people, and yes, he did bring out the best in them. One can say he was at the right place at the right time. but i believe he was the right man at the right place at the right time he brought together exceptional people to create the most spectacular empire in the world at the time and a large credit for it goes to his ability to understand human nature the ability that cannot be learned from books or be taught by tutors or athaliks an ability that was not limited by biases or fears of the other but fueled by curiosity about human nature and it was with this ability that he brought together a culturally diverse court that had painters like dashwant who was originally a lower caste man todarmal who handled finances and revived tax systems and who was originally a minister under sher shah sur man singh and his military genius badoni abul fazl and abdur rahim's literary genius and of course mahesh das birbar And no these were not nine gems there were no official nine gems or navratna that's just a legend we will talk about these extraordinary people and india at the time what it was like and what happened further in akbar's life his marriages and stuff in the next video you can buy me a coffee link in the description hope you enjoyed see you next monday